it's a challenging thing because the AI growing so fast, none of the universities can catch up. There is a new product, new language, new direction until you printing the books, making the curriculums on everything. It takes years because when you going into the direction of artificial intelligence, if you don't have a strong math base, you're getting just going to be just a user, basically. What the Armenian university is good at, have like special courses that quickly adopting to the new changes and uh, giving that kind of knowledge and understanding the what's the machine learning, what's the AI. But what we want to do, we want to show that we can deliver the startups. The markets have a huger opportunities. That's why a lot of uh, Russian startups, when they move to Armenia, they were surprised that how our visions of the product and the solutions are worldwide, not local. This is what our ultimate goal in Armenian IT, to show that a couple guys in their garage, they can build a cool startup that can raise millions of millions of venture investment money. Hi, I'm Craig Smith, and this is I on AI. Recently, I visited Armenia, an incredible country with a very active tech sector. In this episode, I talked to Rem Darbinian, a serial entrepreneur, angel investor, seasoned advisor, author, and keynote speaker with an investment portfolio of over 40 startups. He's the founder and CEO of SmartClick, which builds deep tech innovations based on artificial intelligence and machine learning. He's also the founder and CEO of Viral Mango, a platform that connects influencers with brands. We talked about the tech sector and AI development in Armenia, as well as Viral Mango. I hope you find the conversation as interesting as I did. Okay, so Ram, tell me who you are and then we'll start talking. Okay. Rem Darbinian, born in Armenia, Yerevan, in this city, a uh, couple blocks from here, where we are recording right now. Um, and beginning at the 90s, uh, when the like, Soviet Union collapsed, it was a hard time to live in Armenia. My family moved to Russia. Oh. Yeah, when I was a kid, I moved to there, graduated uh, middle school, high school, university. Wow. Yeah, I started working and uh, in 2008 moved to US. Mm. Yes, and started working for the like basically started from beginning from the zero because you changing the country without anything and uh, went into the different kind of jobs mm -hmm. and eventually start doing some kind of entrepreneurship, some kind of businesses. I made everything from the scratch, basically. Yeah. Um, and But my ultimate goal was move back to Armenia. Yeah. Because my heart was always with Armenia. And then a couple of years ago, uh, after the COVID, I decided that I want to move back to Armenia. I took the family, took the kids, and moved back to Armenia and mm -hmm. started my company in Armenia. Yeah. My startup, uh, I started from Armenia. And it's like a short story. <laughs> yeah, that's the current startup that, uh, that you're uh, working on. We started another one like recently, another like a direction. Yes, but the, the one I'm talking about uh, yeah, that we started like five years ago when I decided to move to Armenia, just yeah. started the company and then moved to Armenia. Yeah, uh, and what I wanted to talk to you about is uh, not only uh, the startup and the startup ecosystem in Armenia, which is why I'm here, but about uh, the introduction of machine learning and how machine learning AI has grown. Uh, and when we were talking the other day, uh, you, you said you had an ambition to yeah. <laughs> to build a machine learning uh, ecosystem. Yeah, I'm a tech guy. I first introduced to the PC was like in 1993 or something like 30 years ago. I fall in love with the computers mm -hmm. and uh, learn everything by myself. Just uh, back in days, there is no much internet, nor there is no much information. So I love like discovering new things. Hi, I wanted to jump in and give a shout out to our sponsor, NetSuite by Oracle. I'm a journalist and getting a single source of truth is nearly impossible. If you're a business owner, 
having a single source of truth is critical to running your operations. If this is you, you should know these three numbers. 36,000, 25, 1. 36,000 because that's the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, because NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need all in one place. As I said, I'm not the most organized person in the world, and there's real power to having all of the information in one place to make better decisions. This is an unprecedented offer by NetSuite to make that possible. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, at netsuite.com slash I on AI. That's I on AI, E-Y-E-O-N-A-I, all run together. Go to netsuite.com slash I on AI to get your own KPI checklist. Again, that's netsuite.com slash I on AI, E-Y-E-O-N-A-I. They support us, so let's support them. Mm -hmm. And uh, like probably eight, nine years ago, I discovered, oh, there's a cool thing called artificial intelligence that can help mm -hmm. them automate some kind of things. Uh, I start like gathering information because there is no much information about AI back in days. It was mm -hmm. the tool for the big corporation, not right. for the like even mid-level companies. Uh, like something here, something there, like kind of reading some kind of old school books, mm -hmm. which is uh, just more uh, theoretical than the practical. Mm -hmm. And uh, at some point I came to the conclusion, like this is something I want to learn. Uh, this yeah. is something I want to do. This is something that gonna, uh, th th we're going to do in the future. This mm -hmm. is something big. Yeah. And I came to the like some kind of a, a list of the top countries that have artificial intelligence and uh, being Armenian, you always look your country in the right. list, you know? Right. And of course, the top five countries, the US, China, you know, Israel, Canada, these kind of countries, and there is no Armenia. Yeah. And I, I got like disappointed at some yeah. point. I'm like, yeah. oh, where, where is Armenia? And I decided that if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to start a company that's doing artificial intelligence, I'm going to do it in Armenia. Uh, that have a roots from Armenia. I came to Armenia. I start like looking who who knows the what's the AI in Armenia. Yeah. And five six years ago, there's only like a handful of people knows what's the AI. Yeah. And then uh, I start gathering. We start gathering together, learning things. Like start teaching a new generation of the uh, kids. Like that. Uh, this is something cool. This is yeah. the next level. It was even before this, all this chat GPT madness, right. all this like yeah. becoming mainstream. It was yeah. a hard code. You yeah, writing this everything. This is like what, what year? Uh, about? 2018, 2019. Right. Yeah. yeah. And um, I established the company. We started doing AI. And the, my main ambition and goal was to show that we can deliver this to the world. You know, it's a technology we can build in Armenia and showed the world that uh, it's made in Armenia mm -hmm. and somehow replaced the understanding of AI that is not uh, artificial intelligence, it can be the Armenian intelligence. <laughs> yes, and uh, since then we, uh, we grow, we have a lot of data scientists in Armenia, we have a lot of AI startups started in Armenia uh, last several years. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm proud to see that Armenia right now in a 54th place in global ranking of the uh, AI index across all other countries. 
Wow. Well, that's yeah. that's that's quite a feat. I mean, our AI is moving fast, but course, but Armenia yes. is moving fast too. A lot of uh, I'm going to do a few episodes here, and uh, so I'll talk about this history elsewhere. But but you moved to Russia, and and uh, uh, Armenia. A lot of people don't realize was was kind of one of the uh, tech centers for the Soviet Union. So there is a tradition of uh, mathematics and and technology engineering in Armenia. Uh, of course, that generation uh, is is older, and that was long before AI. But has that given Armenia kind of a base on which to build? Of course, of course. Uh, if we look, take a back uh, when Armenia was part of the USSR, Soviet Union, uh, all all our great mathematicians or our like a scientist was part of the USSR. And then right. we don't like specifically can say that, oh, this person was responsible to inventing this kind of thing because we have, or for example, the Armenian person who invented one of the nuclear bombs for the Russia, uh, mm. for the USSR back in days. Yeah. And, but nobody's saying about that. He was like, yeah. it was very secret. But the, I think the main, how it started, if we go back to the 1950s, mm -hmm. uh, after the World War II, uh, the U.S. started moving towards developing some kind of computers, the mm -hmm. first, first version of the computers. And the USSR, they were thinking that it's a, just a distraction mm. from the moon program for going to, uh, to the space because of the Cold War. And they didn't like start going to that direction. Although they have spies, they have like all that information that U.S. developing the computers, they missed that starting point. Hmm. And then uh, several years later, they're like, "Oh, we're missing something. They're really developing the computer that's gonna help to automate the process of going to the space, doing the, all the calculations." And they they start thinking, "Okay, how we can catch up." Mm -hmm. They collected all the smart people at that point they have. And then one of the smartest person at that time was the Sergei Mergelian. He was the one of the brightest Armenian minds in mm -hmm. mathematics. Uh, he got his PhD when he was, I think, the 20 years old. He was mm -hmm. like a very like a bright mind. Right. And they said like, okay, we want to develop the IT basically, so it's not IT, but like a tech yeah. centers in different parts of the USSR. Mm -hmm. And they developed four centers, Moscow, Kiev, St. Petersburg, and in Yerevan, the mm -hmm. fourth one in Yerevan. So like it was four development centers. And this Sergei Mergelan became the one of the founders of this, the Armenian IT infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And one of the first U uh, USSR computers was built it in Yerevan, Armenia. Hmm. If you're going back to the like the historical, and it's become like the foundation of having like um, mathematics school of Armenia, hmm. and right now uh, that place that the uh, the place when the first uh, the USSR computer was built, it, now a lot of IT companies renting offices. Our office located them. It's becoming like an IT hub. Oh. Uh, uh, yes, and then. Uh, it's it's still continuing that tradition that a lot of technologies are building in that place and continuing to growth over the world basically yeah. and uh, among the the universities uh, i mean what i've been told is is the startup culture uh, or the private sector is much stronger uh, in AI than the universities, but is that right? Or, or which universities are, are have the strongest machine learning programs, and and uh, are the is is there a community of young machine learning engineers that's growing uh, that's that's going to be able to uh, propel mm -hmm. this this further? Uh, there is a. Actually, it's a challenging thing because the AI growing so fast, yeah. none of the universities can catch up with right. the technology changing, you know, right. because, uh, you know, there is a new product, new language, new direction, machine learning, deep learning, something until it's becoming like a popular until you printing the books, making the curriculums on everything. Right. It takes years. Yeah. 
and this changing very fast. And then what the universities in Armenia doing good, they're giving a good foundation of mathematics, mm -hmm. which is like a core thing for sure. the AI. Yeah. Uh, because um, when you going into the direction of artificial intelligence, if you don't have a strong math base, you can just gonna be a, just a user basically using other yeah. uh, algorithms, technologies, something. Uh, what the Armenian university is good at, they're giving the good foundation of math. So we have that, and then of course, most probably all of the universities right now they have like special courses that quickly adopting to the new changes and uh, giving this kind of knowledge and understanding the what's the machine learning, what's the AI. I, I believe all of the universities right now have some kind of a small part of their uh, that teaching the AI as the base, you know. So you have at least the general understanding, what's the AI, how it works, mm -hmm. where to look, what's the direction it's going, you know. Yeah, and so the first startup you said you wanted to start an AI company. I mean, that sounds extremely ambitious. Uh, what what were you doing? What was the product or service? So we're developing the computer vision technologies. Um, we came to the conclusion that we don't want to build a product. We want to build the technologies as mm -hmm. part of our like a mission and vision. What we want to do. So we start building computer vision technologies and offering other companies from overseas to use this kind of technologies. Mm. And we're always saying like this technology is built in Armenia. What we want to see, we want to see that other companies located uh, in other countries uh, using our technologies to uh, get bigger, mm -hmm. uh, get into the success. And uh, we can probably say that in the foundation of these companies, was our technology that helped them to achieve that, basically. Yeah. And when you say computer vision, uh, what what kind of computer different vision Different kind system? of, we have like, at the moment, we have uh, like uh, several dozen different kind of technologies built it from the scratch, everything. We made it uh, in-house, basically. Uh, helping companies, starting from detecting like uh, license plate numbers, mm -hmm. Uh, logo detection, different kind of small and uh, but very useful technologies that uh, dozens of dozens of companies using uh, overseas and uh, getting into the their uh, target goals basically. Yeah. Uh, another thing that I've heard uh, Armenia uh, was was very much an outsource uh, industry. I mean, you were. Uh, you know, like an OEM provider for uh, companies overseas, they would come here to, to hire uh, people to build their products. Uh, yeah. And then with the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, uh, a lot of companies relocated to Russia, uh, I think. From uh, Russia. Yeah. From Russia, I'm yeah. sorry, yeah, re relocated yeah. from Russia. <laughs> and, and that influx of capital uh, drove uh, the Armenian uh, uh, currency uh, very high and made the outsource uh, services uncompetitive. They were now too expensive. That's what I've heard. And so a lot of people switched to building products as opposed to operating uh, as outsource. Actually, it, uh, it's switching to building the products started like uh, much earlier than the war in Ukraine. Uh, probably... I'll say eight to nine years ago, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of yet yeah, yes we used to be like the a lot of we doing a lot of outsourcing. Mm -hmm. uh, we're developing the technologies, we're developing the products that uh, getting success into the market, but we are under the like uh, radar. We don't see nobody sees our success. Right. Yeah, and then at some point we see that okay we can develop these cool kind of products why we don't start building this kind of startups in Armenia. Yeah. And probably from, uh, I'll say 2014, 15, the first Armenian, like a big startup start popping up. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier that, uh, the Pixar, one of the biggest uh, made in Armenia, basically startup, already unicorn uh, established in Armenia. And since then, a lot of startups, like a lot of companies start 
moving from outsource to the product prior mm-hmm. to even the, before the war. Right. Uh, there are still a lot of like outsource companies because it brings money, but the last six six years there's like a a lot of Armenian startups start uh, appearing in the market mm-hmm. because uh, it is more profitable. It is more interesting when you're building your own product other than just uh, developing without understanding some kind of small part of it. Of course, when the war started, a lot of people from Ukraine, from Russia, from other countries moved to Armenia because we are uh, very tech friendly. Mm-hmm and overall friendly, uh, but we have like a huge IT community at that point. Yeah. And when the startups and the companies start moving to Armenia, they see that we have this capacity, we have this knowledge, we can help them, we have the infrastructure, we have everything. And they love it. Mm-hmm. Um, and they start relocating their offices to Armenia. But to be honest, we are not ready to that. You know, we have some kind of a limitation capacity. That's why it's drove somehow like a currency value changed. And of course, it's become less profitable to be at the outsource company. Mm-hmm. But as a startup, it's okay to be there. You know, it's still, you're still struggling because as a startup, you're earning money overseas yep. in the US or currency or European euros, uh, but you pay salaries in Armenia, which is a conversion affects you highly. But of course, um, still we are moving towards uh, having the product country, not not the outsource country anymore. Right. I think the direction is set. We're already going to that direction. And uh, we, we see like a lot of big, big startups appearing in the market last several years. Yeah, yeah. On the outsource, there is still some outsource here. Yes. Uh, and and so, uh, you know, I've spent m- much of my life in China. Uh, and, you know, China and India are, China less so because there's a concern about IP protection, but India certainly is a massive uh, outsource market where people uh, go to find engineers to build things. Uh, if companies, uh, for for companies wanting to do that in Armenia, how do you navigate that? I was surprised to learn that because in the United States, I'd never heard, I've heard of Poland, I've heard of, uh, you know, India as, uh, as markets to build things. But again, uh, we're a small country even if we want to we can be like you know like very like a visible in the market you know because if we become the visible and we get a lot of orders we can't fulfill that that's right. why a lot of like uh, outsource companies uh although they they're earning money they're delivering some kind of value to the us or other countries uh, startups or companies uh we have some kind of a limitation on capacity what we can deliver yeah, uh, and at some point it maybe even doesn't make sense to to show that we can uh, be outsourced country. Otherwise, we're gonna be overwhelmed with the orders, and then right. we can fulfill the quality gonna go down. Uh, but what we want to do, we want to show that we can deliver the startups and the products. What mm. this is what our ultimate goal in Armenian IT to show that. Uh, couple guys in their garage that can build a cool startup that can uh, raise millions of millions of uh, venture investments money and become uh, the unicorn at some point. Yeah. It started in Armenia, but of course you need to go to the uh, US or other big markets. This is the another b- cool thing because uh, when you are like a Poland or Indian startup, when you're starting the building the startup, you always look at the internal market, right. your local market to build the startups. Our local market is small, and that's why we almost always think about the bigger markets. Yeah. The markets have a huger opportunities. That's why a lot of uh, Russian startups, when they moved to Armenia, they're surprised that we how we are like a uh, how our visions of the product and the solutions are uh, worldwide, not local. 
Right. Because the Russian startups, they're always building a startup for the local market. Yeah. It's a huge market, Russia. Yeah. Uh, and they never, uh, they never uh, think about how we can go to the U.S. market or overseas market. They don't have the knowledge. We have that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And we have another like a cool thing, opportunity, something that we can call. Um, since Armenia many years goes through the different challenges, problems, issues, uh, a lot of Armenians left their home country mm -hmm. to the different countries. And we considers, uh, consider ourselves as a network nation. Mm -hmm. Uh, we spread it all over the world. Uh, we have like uh, generations of Armenians living overseas. Uh, they um, survived from the genocide in 1915. They went to the European countries, U.S. And then it's repeated several times. Uh, recently, we see this kind of uh, issue as well. And we have Armenians all over the world. Mm -hmm. And they they live, they integrate it on their different countries' lives, becoming popular, becoming like uh, achieving some kind of positions. And since when you left your home, you always feel connected with your home. Mm -hmm. And anytime Armenian startup need to reach kind of some kind of companies, there's always some kind of person in that big corporation that is right. Armenian that can help you to open the door. Yeah. This is uh, some kind of like our uh, secret sauce, basically, I would say, that uh, help us to reach some kind of uh, people, some kind of opportunity, gives our startup some kind of small opportunity to show ourselves to just get in the front of the door, basically. Yeah. And then the rest, of course, it's the how you uh, solving the problems, uh, yeah. of course. But this is the thing that the Armenian community is trying to achieve, show that we can be the product company, not the outsourced country. Yeah, uh, and, and in, in terms of, the, the, I met you at uh, uh, Silicon Mountain, uh, a conference here. Uh, is, is that, uh, is the t tech industry pushing that uh, that label Silicon Mountains, or is that was that just the name of the conference? Just the name of the conference, I think. Yeah. But what we're trying to show that we can have basically the um, similar thing in Armenia. We can mm -hmm. become like some kind of ultimate hub of the startups in this region. Right. Uh, we have the knowledge, we have the capacity, we have the opportunity. Uh, that's why we want to become like some kind of the center of uh, the region to become the uh, hub of the startup development. Yeah, um, and and then f there there are people or or companies in in the West are starting uh, to acquire. Uh, Armenian startups at, at Silicon uh, Mountain, the, the conference, uh, there was a CEO of Adobe who was here to officiate at the opening of a building uh, because they had bought a, a company here. Uh, what, what Do you know the name of the company? Workfront. That they, the company called Workfront, they acquired several years ago. Uh, we see several that kind of uh, acquisitions like that. Uh, when you're becoming a bigger and then becoming visible in the international market, uh, big corporations look into you. And then after they acquiring you, basically, uh, they don't want to close it because sure. just uh, taking the uh, your the clients or just the intellectual property, they see the opportunity to grow and continue developing this product in Armenia. That's why uh, we see several other companies looking not only acquisition of the Armenian startups, but also opening their offices in Armenia and doing some kind of research and development part of their some kind of a small part of the product in Armenia. Yeah. Uh, we see recently the NVIDIA opened the office in Armenia as well, and several other companies looking into the opening offices in Armenia. Right. Yeah, and and your uh, one of the things on this idea of switching from outsource to product, 
that requires you, you you marketing a product from Armenia in the United States or in Europe or wherever, whichever market. I mean, I guess Russia is an easier market because it's closer. Uh, but how do you overcome that? Uh, uh, and, and talk a little bit about the second startup that uh, I saw. There was another conference, mm -hmm. uh, which is the primary reason I came, Digitech 2023, uh, that featured a lot of Armenian startups, and, and yours was there. Uh, can you tell us about, about that? And how do you reach the the western market i mean that to me uh, sounds like a big, big uh, hurdle so again a lot of experience came from the doing outsourcing stuff in the back in days mm -hmm. we have a lot of specialists that used to do the marketing for the u.s companies so they work for the u.s companies doing the advertising and the social media marketing for the u.s and uh, we gather like a specialist in armenia that have a lot of experience but of course, uh, we're looking for the new things, always keeping touch in the what's what's changing in the market. Mm -hmm. And uh, being in Armenia, it's uh, again, uh, we are very flexible. Mm -hmm. we, we are not a big corporation. We are implementing all the changes very quick, learning very fast. This is like our one of the advantages. That's why if there's something need to be promoted in the US from Armenia, uh, there is no borders. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if the several years ago, uh, you need to go to the in-person meetings after the COVID, it became like all obsolete. Right. Now it, you can do everything through the Zoom. And that's why it's not as hard as it seems mm -hmm. if you put enough effort, uh, enough time to learn the new thing that's appearing in the, in the market. Uh, regarding the our second startup we're doing, this is again, it's a marketing, marketing solution. Uh, a couple of years ago, I see like a huge opportunity that the markets moved from the regular advertising into the influencer marketing. Mm -hmm. And the influencers start taking some money from the big corporations like mm -hmm. Google and the Facebook. Mm -hmm. If back in days, the all the money from their uh, f social impacts on the influencers was earning by the Facebook or Google. Now uh, the influencers are taking that money back from the b big corporation. They start mm -hmm. earning money doing that influencer marketing. And then we jump into the, this field and start helping the influencers and the brands connecting together, helping them to for the, from the brand sides to see uh, which influencers is perfectly matching with them. Mm -hmm. And our knowledge of artificial intelligence help us a lot because there's a lot of data need to be analyzed. Right. A lot of data need to be much made together. And uh, on the other hand, we start helping the influencers to be more visible for the brand. So basically, if you are a good influencer, if you have a good influence, even if you are a small nano influencer, up to five, 10,000, 15,000 followers, you still can earn a lot of money, but you need to be visible. Mm -hmm. So if you are a good quality creator, mm -hmm. we help them to get in the front of the brands, connecting together so we, they can start working and earning money without a uh, middleman, basically. Yeah, and the the machine learning uh, that that's analyzing all this data, what, what kinds of, I imagine you're looking for uh, patterns that match between uh, the, the the brand and the and the influencer what kind of systems do you use Ooh, for it's, that it's a very complicated system I'll be honest it seems very easy from outside but mm -hmm. inside there's a lot of data going on because it's not just a just a brand and an influencer there are like hundreds of million influencers in the world and then mm -hmm. there's a lot of brands it's all about like understanding the what the brands needs Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the most important part, it's not the finding the perfect influencer, also finding the who is following this influencer. So mm -hmm. we're analyzing basically each follower of this influencer to maximize the matchmaking with this brand's needs. Mm -hmm. For example, if it's the Coca-Cola and uh, Coca-Cola looking for the influencer, it's not only just finding the perfect influencer, also finding the people who loves Coca-Cola that follows these influencers. Mm -hmm. So they need to be 
like a certain percentage of the followers so that when the influencer tell them something, uh, share his or her experience, they can uh, be uh, some kind of attached to this content, you know, that they like it some kind of. Yeah. This is the hard part. There's a lot of data going on, uh, this uh, insane amount, and then we can do this probably. Mm, now it's computing technologies are much faster. Mm-hmm. Uh, four or five years ago, I can't even imagine doing this kind of stuff mm. because it will take it will cost a lot of a lot of money. Now yeah. it's much much cheaper, basically. Yeah, and and you're you're getting the data from. We're getting data from the users, from the social media, they're connecting their accounts to our system. We uh, officially collect all their data. And then, uh, so this is this is like just gathering the data. It's not all about the data, it's just uh, how you can process it. Yeah, but uh, how do you reach the influencers? Uh, uh, or, or is it through marketing and then they sign up? to the platform or or are you contacting influencers one by one we have different ways uh um, we mainly like receiving the inbounding so they searching they finding our product they're looking for this kind of solution we're getting a lot of google and uh, inbounding traffic Mm -hmm. directly coming to our page and looking for this kind of solutions and after they sign up we're getting all their data after the consent and then start working with this data. And the interesting part, they start using it, they loving it. They start sharing about the product that, oh, sure, this is a cool thing. Yeah. And then and that brings more and more people. So it's like yeah. some kind of a viral loop yeah. working for us. So more people using, more people are coming, and in, and so on and so on. Yeah. It's growing uh, very fast right now. What's the name of the, the platform? Viral Mango. Viral Mango, yeah. yeah I it's like, like a, <laughs> we would try to make some kind of like, um, unique name that you can remember <laughs> yeah yeah and then on the brand side i would imagine the brands are a lot of people are trying to sell the brands on platforms like this so how do you how do you attract the brand uh we don't work on attracting brands because uh we just show what we have what influencers we are working and then it gives them confidence because uh, for the brands, it's a big challenge as well to find the right influencer. Mm-hmm. So in this part of our program, uh, like we're trying to help more influencers. And when the brands looking for the influencers, they, he- they see who we are working with and they're happy to, to find them through us, basically. Mm-hmm. It's again, it's more inbounding. We're helping the influencers. And then as soon as the brand sees that what we have, what the influencer we are working with, they are happy to join us to find them. And because they know that once they work with us, uh, they'll see like a better quality influencers, better matchmaking and et cetera. Right. And your revenue, uh, uh, do you essentially uh, take a cut of, of whatever... Uh, revenue, the infl- I mean, where is the revenue coming from, or is it a, a, a subscription model where that you're Depending selling? Depending what brands? part of our product we have subscription base for just finding, if they want to help us to then get connected, and then we're becoming some kind of a middleman of between them, we take some kind of commission uh, as well because there's a lot of fraud going on. A lot of mm-hmm. influencers see that the brand's asking them to do the, some kind of task and they don't get paid at the end right. or the same way uh, the opposite way brands pay up front and then the influencer disappears so we're becoming like some kind of middleman that we can collect the payment and then be the the, the person who judges you know who've done what part and then uh, either we return the money if the deal is not done yet or they pay the influencer as soon as uh, they f- complete all the task right of uh, the uh, with a lot of these platforms, I mean, I'm I'm supposed to be talking about AI, but it's interesting. <laughs> a lot of these platforms, uh, you know, once you make the connection, Upwork is an example. You know, once you make the connection, you kind of make a private deal and go off platform. So Upwork's no longer getting. Is that a problem? Uh, no, because. Um 
it's not like a brands wanna every day work with the same person. They need to fresh blood every right. week, every month, basically. That's why it's uh, it's a continuing thing. Hmm. A uh, brand need to test it and work with uh, several hundreds uh, influencers at once, and uh, we help them to understand who's the best, who gives the best ROI on their like a dollar amount spend. After they um, they find their perfect influencer, of course they go that this influencer might become the brand ambassador for these brands. Of right. course, they're or doing the, some kind of direct deal. But before that, they do a lot of testing. They work together with the different influencers. Uh, basically, uh, if we take a like analogy with the LinkedIn, mm -hmm. uh, people were updating their LinkedIn once in a, like a two three years when they're mm -hmm. changing the job. With our solution, they need to keep updated every week, and they doing collaborations every week basically because the same influencer might work with the different brands every week, or mm -hmm. twice or three times a week and the brands as well. So it's uh, uh, always ongoing uh, work, basically. Yeah. And to build the solution, how, how many engineers did you require or, or, or do you need? Actually, we started um, very lean. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a, a huge fan of the lean startup idea, how you need to like validate. So mm -hmm. basically, uh, we started with uh, only one engineer, couple the uh, customer success specialist. Mm -hmm. We val validated each step of it before moving forward and before proceeding and developing ev like even the first line of the code. So basically, we got the clients even before we have even the part of our program. We have just the screenshots basically when we wow. started. So yeah, it's it's another thing we are uh, I'm trying to implement in Armenia to go to Lean to uh, basically fail fast, check it out everything and see if it works and then start building because uh, we need like a quick turnaround. We need to take it uh, to the market much quicker than just uh, building the MVP, the showing to the market. It's a little bit time changes basically. Yeah. Now you can do it in a different way much efficient yeah. way yeah uh and and i would imagine you're continuing to deepen the tech stack or, or build new features so are you still just a couple of engineers or, or are you we're still a couple of engineers we're yeah. doing uh by the way uh i was like we're discussing this with our cto uh, recently and he started using one of the new ai technologies and his efficiency went up to like a 30 40 percent using some kind of ai tool that's that, that copilot yeah copilot yes yeah. of course yes that helps to write part of the code so basically we got advantage of using ai technologies and instead of hiring we pay like a very small fee like 20 30 dollar right. a month or something like that and having a paid version of the copilot that uh, just increases our capacity of the development, basically. And this is one of the things um, I keep asking a lot of uh, different conferences, different when I'm like uh, doing the panel discussions, they keep asking, oh, what's going to happen with the job market with these AI tools? And what I'm saying, I'm continuing to say, it's not a, a just uh, AI going to took over some kind of jobs. It's a lot of time, there's a lot of, people who are using the AI will take the job from the people who are not using AI yeah, yet. This is, the, this is the interesting thing. Of course, there's going to be market disruption. A lot of jobs going to be obsolete in a couple of years. But this is part of the evolution we've seen many times through the Industrial Revolution, different kind of play, uh, time of the uh, development of the changes, the innovations. But... Right now, I see that people need to understand how the AI works, mm -hmm. how the technologies are works, and how they can leverage this. Because mm -hmm. there's a, like a very good saying that uh, uh, God made everyone equal, and then the Samuel Court uh, make them equal. You know, like yeah. it just like 
when you're using this revolver, now you're equal to everyone else who have this kind of technology. Same with AI. Yeah. We are now technically equal to each other. Yeah, that's, uh, that is remarkable uh, in how quickly it's spread. Um, I've, I've got to ask, since we're uh, just a, a couple of weeks away uh, or off of the uh, tension with Azerbaijan, I, I understand there's now uh, some diplomatic moves uh, that are easing tensions, but is uh, th that uh, that hit the international news uh, uh, and a lot of people who in the West who aren't thinking about Armenia suddenly thought about Armenia but as, as, as a, a place with a security issue. Is that, uh, do you think that's going to have an impact at all on the development of, of the uh, tech ecosystem here? Of course, it's affecting the developing the ecosystem because we are all humans, mm -hmm. uh, and we live in this country. And every day, uh, when you see that uh, shooting happen, some kind of you know like genocide happen, what we see like uh, last month that more than hundred thousand Armenians moved from their homes back to the part of the Armenia they relocated forcibly. Uh, it's affecting uh, our development process, our vision, our, you know, like instead of uh, working on the product, delivering the products, you think about like uh, your friends, family, neighbors, uh, other Armenians that impacted through this. Uh, we can't just, you know, we're not robots. We, we, we are human beings. And of course, it's affecting overall the ecosystem at first. Second, of course, it's a security thing. For example, if the developers, uh, founders or startups, uh, they feel safe living in Armenia and developing from here, some of them, they might think, okay, it's not uh, safe anymore. I might move from other and then do my job or a developed startup from other country. This is another thing that impacting the overall the ecosystem. And the third part probably is that uh, being Armenian startups, we receive uh, venture investments or any mm -hmm. other investments from overseas. Mm -hmm. So of course, when it's not stable in the region, uh, nobody want to put money into that basket. And that's affecting as well. And uh, and overall, uh, you know, you always on the edge, basically. Yeah. And yeah. it's uh, it 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 can't be just uh, invisible. You know, it's affecting a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I'm up to an hour, and I don't know if uh, if the the next guy. I've got three interviews. Oh, like that. that's a lot. You can. <laughs> Uh, but is there anything that you, that you want to say that we didn't cover? I don't know. We we covered a lot of. It's very very. That's uh, I I like it. I love it. Uh, yeah. How it goes. Yeah. You know, like uh, we covered a lot of things, and overall, you know, um, the, the we have a problem that the Armenia basically is invisible for other yeah. countries. Yeah. I don't want to see Armenia in the news about uh, war, in the, them kind of like attentions, any kind of things. What my vision is to see Armenia in a good way, you know, we develop some kind of cool technology, we solve that kind of huge problem for the world. That's why I want to see Armenia in the news, you know, like yeah. to becoming um, uh, number one in things in the news, not in the bad way in yeah, a good part sure. of the yeah. news section, you know. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we don't see that much often. Yeah. But we need to continue work, and then I hope we're going to succeed that soon and then have the peace in the region because we see the other problems recently with the, another neighbors. Yeah. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, this is great. I, I wanted to jump in and give a shout-out to our sponsor, NetSuite by Oracle. I'm a journalist and getting a single source of truth is nearly impossible. If you're a business owner, having a single source of truth is critical 
to running your operations. If this is you, you should know these three numbers. 36,000, 25, 1. 36,000 because that's the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25 because NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need all in one place. As I said, I'm not the most organized person in the world, and there's real power to having all of the information in one place to make better decisions. This is an unprecedented offer by NetSuite to make that possible. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, at netsuite.com slash I on AI. That's I on AI, E-Y-E-O-N-A-I, all run together. Go to netsuite.com slash I on AI to get your own KPI checklist. Again, that's netsuite.com slash I on AI, E-Y-E-O-N-A-I. They support us, so let's support them. That's it for this episode. I want to thank Rem for his time. If you want to read a transcript of the conversation today, you can find one on our website, I on AI. That's E-Y-E hyphen O-N dot A-I. In the meantime, remember, the singularity may not be near, but AI is changing your world. So pay attention.